Hello, and welcome to the Feeling Good Podcast, where you can learn powerful techniques to change the way you feel. I am your host, Dr. Rhonda Borowski, and joining me here in the Murrieta studio is Dr. David Burns. Dr. Burns is a pioneer in the development of cognitive behavioral therapy and the creator of the new Teen Therapy. He is the author of Feeling Good, which has sold over 5 million copies in the United States and has been translated into over 30 languages. His latest book, Feeling Great, contains powerful new techniques that make rapid recovery possible for many people struggling with depression and anxiety. Dr. Burns is currently an emeritus adjunct professor of clinical psychiatry at Stanford University School of Medicine. (laughs) All right. Hello, Rhonda. Hello, David, and welcome everyone to episode 299. We welcome our listeners around the country and across the world. This is another Ask David episode but sadly, Matt May couldn't join us. So it's just me and David. David This is revert revert to old times, but it was always fun. It's just great with Matt, but uh, it's great with you too, Rhonda. So I hope we can bring some fun and energy to our audience today and answer some really cool questions. Yeah, I think we will. So I have two announcements to to make, and then I pulled out a pretty cool endorsement to read. So let me start off by saying that There is a Team CBT World Congress being organized for August 18th to the 21st in Warsaw, Poland. And it's going to be similar to an intensive where the fundamentals and the foundations of Team CBT are going to be taught. There's going to be opportunity for demonstrations and for lots and lots of practice. And there are going to be teachers from all over the world. This It's being organized by um, some pretty awesome team therapists, Daniel Minty, Mariusz Wurga, and Yehuda Bar Shalom. And some of the teachers are going to be uh, Matt May, Mike Christensen, Lee Harrington, Victoria Chikorel, Sylvina Bucci, Steve Reinhardt, Andy Pearson, Dipti Joshi, Navadita Singh, did I say Heather Clegg, and Rhonda Borowski. Me. Fantastic. I have a question. Are they going to get that guy Burns? I don't think he's heard of this conference. Well, they're trying to get Burns online. I believe they're inviting David Burns to come online. And because it's in Poland, you know, obviously it's going to be um, close. The situation is going to be closely monitored and it might be a combination of in-person classes and online classes. But the best thing to do, if you're interested in this incredible World Congress is to go to the following website and find out about it. And that is pretty simple, teamcbt.eu. That's T-E-A-M-C-B-T dot E-U. Let me read the other announcement. The other okay. announcement is about the book, the Feeling Great Book Club that Heather Clegg and Brandon Vance teach. And this is a lot of advanced notice, but we want everyone to have the opportunity to sign up. And the book clubs are going to start on Tuesday, September 13th. They're going to be two times so people from around the world can join. One group will start at 8.30 a.m. and the other group will start at 5 o'clock p.m. Those are Pacific time. And each group will run for 12 weeks. They meet 100% on Zoom. People from all over the world are welcome. And what this book club does is it supports people in getting the most out of feeling great with small group discussions, a supportive community to work through the exercises in the book, and people can ask questions, and there are going to also be demonstrations of various methods. And they're really excited about this year because a number of the past participants are going to be joining this group as helpers. And it's very reasonable. It's only $12 per session. There is a sliding scale and no one is turned away for lack of funds. So there's two ways to join. You can go to the feelinggreattherapycenter.com slash book club, or you can just Google Feeling Great Book Club and you'll get the link to the website. Well, this is fantastic. Uh, And we don't, have paid ads on on our uh, podcasts it's all volunteer work and uh, but we'll occasionally promote something 
not because we get any money promoting it, but because we think it's a cool thing. And there have been at least two or three uh, of, of these feeling great book clubs with uh, Brandon and now now with he Heather and people have totally loved them there's generally uh, 40 50 uh, people uh, in, in in each book club uh, they have fun they they learn things uh, it it it's upbeat uh, it, it's inexpensive it's, it's free if you can't afford it and I just strongly rec recommend this it's a great way to look go through feeling great and you know chapter at a time get get help with it get moral support from people and just have some fun people to relate to every week so i i give this uh, uh give heather and brandon and all the people who are going to be helping them and working with them a huge a plus on this and i'd encourage you to 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 give it a try i think you'll really have a a, a fun time and it can change your life yes exactly i've worked with some people who have graduated from the book club and they all have incredible skills and a great deal of benefit out of it yeah so let me read one kind of cool endorsement this is this says dear dr burns i hope this email finds you well i am a newly graduated doctor from the united kingdom i have been struggling with anxiety and perfectionist perfectionistic behavior for as long as I can remember. This has been reflected in my character and was noticed by close friends and family to me. One of my siblings recommended your book, The Feeling Good Handbook, which I have been using for the past couple of weeks. I would like to convey my sincere thanks to you, as within a relatively quick period of time, I have noticed a remarkable change in my thought process and my mood and feelings. I'm aware that you may get these emails quite frequently, but this message is another person's life that you're in the process of transforming thanks to your writing. I shall continue to read your book and apply the techniques, and I'm very much excited for the change it will bring. Best wishes. Well, thank you so much. Did this person give her name or his name? Or her, um, He did, but he asked his name to be withheld. Oh, okay. Uh, well, thank you so much for that for that kind uh, note i i deeply appreciate it and and uh i might give a little promotion to the feeling good handbook we haven't mentioned it for a long time but it's it was the first true sequel to feeling good and it's a kind of an interactive thing with a lot of exercises you can do and just like my first book feeling good many many people who read it have experienced a transformation in their lives elimination of depression and f feeling joy sometimes for the for the first time so if you've been struggling with depression or anxiety uh i i think you could do yourself a big favor by by picking up a comp copy of the feeling good handbook and if you get the hard copy rather than some verbal uh you know audio version of it i i would recommend that because there's a lot of exercises to do and that's where a lot of the learning and change happens so that that's the feeling good handbook and you can get it uh, on, on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Well, are we ready to dive into our first question? Yep, absolutely. And thanks for all of you for submitting uh, questions. We've got, we've got a ton of them. We'll do as many as we can today. Okay. Well, this is from Paul. And he asked, are you planning on doing a podcast about people who are about to retire and are very anxious about the prospect and also depressed about closing that chapter in their lives? I'm in that boat. Right. Well, thanks, Paul. I'm glad you you asked. And um, in my written show notes response, I, I ask you if you've read the introduction to Feeling Great, my latest book, because it has an example uh, of, about this e exact thing. And um, and and what what's in there is is uh, a story of a, a man. I'm I'm calling him Bill. I can't remember his his. Uh, his actual name i'm always disguising people's names but he was doing some uh, work on our house and uh he uh the the last day he'd been working here painting on the outside and fixing things up and my wife and i were just so thrilled with with him and the, the beautiful work that he was doing and then the last day i was coming downstairs and he was kneeling at our front door 
uh, and he looked kind of sad and humble, and he was like fixing the thing that goes across the door, and I, I think he'd, he'd repainted something there, and and uh, and I was about just to tell him how how much we appreciated the fantastic work that he had done, and and uh, and then he says, Do- Doc, you know, I have a qu- question for you. And 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 he said, I I I I, th- I don't know what's going on, but uh, I, I think I might be have depression. And and somebody told me you were a doctor, and, and maybe you'd know if if I should take a a pill or something. And I I asked him, well, what what what's going on? And and, and he said, well, uh, you know, all, all I've been doing since I graduated from high school is just painting people's houses. And and when I, I look back on my life, I realize I've I've never accomplished anything meaningful. And uh, I just feel really down, and and you know my body's getting older, and uh, I don't know how long I'm going to be able to keep up this work. And I have a wife that I love, and I don't know if I'm going to be able to su- support our family. And I'm I'm just really feeling down, and my heart just went out to him, especially since my wife and I have been telling us each other how grateful we were that he was working on our house and at, at a very reasonable price and doing beautiful, gorgeous work. And my heart just broke, and uh, and and I used a technique with him called called the double standard technique, uh, and uh, and and it worked. Uh, amazingly well he didn't catch on to it at, at first it took him about five five minutes but it had to do with you know would, would you say this to a dear friend who was just like you who's retiring say another painter he looks just like you w- would you say to him oh oh gosh your career is coming to an end you've never accomplished anything worthwhile and you know you won't have enough money for retirement and your body's falling apart would, would you say that to a dear friend and and he, at first he said, oh, yeah, I, I, if this guy like with me, I'd, I'd say these exact things. And so I said to him, we'll say that. Uh, uh, pretend, pretend that I'm I'm your friend and, and and just turn to me right now and say, oh, you know, your life is, hasn't amounted to anything. All you've been doing is painting people's houses and your body's falling apart. Say those things to me. And he says, no, no, Doc, I, 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 I can't say them to you. And I said, "Well, why not?" He said, "That that'd be cruel. I'd never say that to to somebody, especially a dear friend, somebody I cared about." And I said, "Well, you have a kind of a double standard then, because you're you're talking to your friend yourself in that way. And if you wouldn't treat somebody in a cruel way, but you're you're treating yourself in a cruel way." And and I said, but say those things to me because you said they're true. They're absolutely true. And you, it's important to be honest. So tell me, you know, I'm your dear friend and say to me, your your life never amounted to anything. And he and he says, I, I, I still can't tell you that. And I said, why not? I, he said, well, because it isn't really true. And mm-hmm. I said, well, what would you say to a dear friend? And he said, I would I would tell him you, you can be be proud of what you've accomplished in your career. You've made so many people happy over, over the years, and you've always worked hard. You've always done beautiful work. You've never overcharged anyone for anything. And you have a retirement plan, and uh, you you'll, you can still work on a part time basis. And uh, you you will you do have enough money to support your wife, and she loves you, and you have every right to be pr- proud of yourself. And I said, have you thought of talking to yourself that way? And then it's like a light bulb went on in his head. I said, he said, oh, you mean it all has to do with the way I'm thinking? I said, absolutely. And you can change the way you think and change the way you feel. And he just lit up and it just made me so happy. And that's just one example of somebody facing retirement. But you can listen to my TED talk, too, about the woman who uh, attempted suicide because she thought she'd never accomplished anything in her life. The the Latvian immigrant. It's a very moving story. And you can get that on on YouTube. You can find it on my website, feelinggood.com, right on the homepage. And you can click on on the TED talk. The uh, the, 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 the the underlying idea here is that there's nothing 
uh, about retirement, really, that, that can cause depression. Only your thoughts can cause depression, the way you're interpreting it, the way you're thinking about it. And if you're depressed, you'll always be telling yourself something that isn't true, something that's distorted. And the great news is the moment you change the way you think, you can change the way you feel. And that's what the business that Rhonda and I are in is sending this message to, to all of you and, and telling stories and teaching techniques so that many of you can, can suddenly grasp this and, and uh, free yourself from depression and anxiety and self-doubt and inadequacy. So that, that's my little blurb there, Rhonda, and, and it didn't give you a chance to chime in at all. I, no, no, that's good. That's good. I think, you know, retirement is a big milestone and a transition for people. And I know fr my, friends of mine who have retired who have not um, planned about it or thought about it and did get depressed and anxious about what they were going to do with the rest of their lives. And I think you've just described what to do when that happens. Like you say, it's not the events of our lives that cause distress. It's how we think about them. So you're, you know, your suggestion that Paul identify the th his thoughts that he's having about what his retirement will be like, and then do what he needs to do to challenge them. It's, yeah, identify the distortions in them, mm -hmm. see what they show about you that's positive and awesome. All of these ideas are in my latest book, Feeling Great. Right. And uh, they're, they're, it's a, it's a self-help book. My first book, Feeling Good, was not a self-help book. This is a self-help book. And, and I've, I've made a conscious attempt to make these techniques simple that you can use. And my, my mission is to help you, the podcast listener, whether you're a therapist or a lay, lay person, to help you change the way you think and feel. And I, I would say one more thing, Rhonda, that you can speak to. This is such a basic idea that our thoughts create all of our feelings. But People don't understand it. And, and when something bad happens, we think it's the event rather than our thoughts. Mm -hmm. And it, it tastes, tests the faith of all, all of us, including yourself, Rhonda. Oh, absolutely. Uh, and sometimes awful things happen to us. Right today, Matt couldn't join us because something hap awful happened to him. And, uh, and I'm sure he's feeling some distress. And when he joins us again, he can, he can tell, us, tell us about it. He's safe. He's healthy. But uh, he had a horrible hack on his website, it was, uh, the cruelest kind of thing. And so we're, we're, we're with you, Matt. We love you. And, uh, and we just look forward to your triumphant return to the podcast to, to share our next uh, Ask David and Matt episode. Yeah. Well, I can tell a real quick story about how events don't um, create the feeling right now. Real quick. Can I tell that real quickly? So, yeah, yeah, was... yeah. One one day, I had I had flowers were delivered to my house, and um, and I had this thought that someone was sending me these flowers in order to poison me, and that if I touched the flowers, I would die of I would get sick or I would I would be poisoned. Okay, now be, be, before you go on, let me say that you had good reason to <laughs> to be suspicious. Uh, Rhonda is not paranoid. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but uh, they, 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 you, you were under threat, let's, let's say. Yeah. So, so you, you, and, and I can remember once in Philadelphia, a, uh, I, I was being stalked by someone who put, a woman who put flowers upside down Ooh. in a, in a, in a, in a flower pot and left it in our garage. Oh my God, how scary. It was frightening. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I actually she had put them like with the head, the the, the yeah. flowers in the water, you know, yeah. in, a, in a pot, you know. Well, I, it was nothing like that. It was just a box that said one eight hundred flowers, and my husband said, "Oh, open the flowers." I was like, "No, we can't open those flowers. That's poison." And he just looked at me like I was crazy, and but I, my heart started racing. I started feeling really anxious. I started feeling really scared. Um. And then I got a text from, from a friend of mine, Sonny Choi, who's been on the podcast. And Sonny said, did you get the flowers? And immediately I felt <laughs> relief and happiness and a little embarrassment that I felt so anxious in the beginning. But it, it wasn't the flowers that caused those feelings. It was my thoughts about the flowers that caused yep. both the distress and the joy. 
Yeah, that great, great story. And Sonny is such a beautiful person, too. And he's so, so, so loving. Yeah. We're going to have him again on our podcast before long. I can't remember the topic, but it'll be fun whenever Sonny is with us. It's a yeah. lot of fun. Okay, okay. Well, let's jump to another question. Okay. So this is about homework. Dear Dr. Burns, many thanks for your blogs, podcasts, books, and Team CBT. I think I'm experiencing being hypnotized with a panic attack patient. I know after my, during my sessions, I feel I can't even think well. I see this client through Skype and don't see her face-to-face due to distances. I've tried many of your approaches, but she's resistant. I do include exposure exercise that she never completes, including how to do a shame attacking exercise when I cannot go with her to the places she needs to go in order to do the exposure. I've even been on the phone and she's been driving, but two years of therapy later, nothing has worked. Any thoughts you have will really help me. Many well, thanks. Great. Uh, and, and what's this person's name or, or the M says is M. Yeah, okay, sure. And that, that's fine. Yes. Well, I think that you have been uh, hypnotized by your patient, M, and that and when you call, you think you're in reverse hypnosis. I, I, I agree with you. Um, it, it's easy to do that. Reverse hypnosis is when the patient hypnotizes the therapist. And there's many versions of it, but often is someone who has uh, struggling with anxiety You see, one of the techniques you need to cure all anxiety is exposure. It's not the only treatment for anxiety, but it always has to be a part of the treatment. And so we have what we call uh, the the, the gentle ultimatum that we give uh, patients at the beginning of of treatment. And and we tell them, here's what you're going to have to do if you want to work with with me. And if if you're depressed, you're going to have to do homework. And it's not negotiable. Because all of our techniques rely on patients doing homework between exercises. And it's a very simple fact that those who do the homework get better and those who refuse to do the homework do not get better. So we can't, I can't ethically accept you into my clinical uh, practice if if you feel strongly that you don't want to be treated with something that requires homework. There's plenty of therapists here in our community who don't use homework. 90% of them or more won't require homework. And so you'll have plenty of therapists who want to treat you, but I can't ethically treat you unless you agree to to that because the, 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 the cure that I have in mind, it won't work without the homework. And similarly, if if the patient is struggling with anxiety, in this case, in case uh, you know, panic attacks or fear of driving, or I guess it's social anxiety, but whatever it is, you're going to have to do exposure. Now, in the old days, when we saw people face to face, I would go out and do the exposure w- w- with the, the patient. But uh, uh, right now with Zoom, uh, you know, we, we have some limitations we didn't have in the past. But regardless, the person must do the homework, the, uh, the exposure. And right at the beginning of treatment, we lay it out there. If, if you're willing to do the exposure, we've got a marriage made in heaven. I'd love to work with you. And the odds are overwhelming that I can not only help you, but cure you or more than more than 100% cure, get you to love the very thing that you were afraid of. Mm. But uh, without the exposure, I I am helpless. Uh, And and so if you don't want to do the exposure, let's be clear on that right now. And then you can go to one of the doctors in our community who, like yourself, don't believe in exposure. And the great majority of the therapists in our communities are afraid of exposure. They don't believe in exposure. And so if that's the way you want to be treated, you can go to one of them. If you want to be treated by me, and I would love to work with you, and I'm hoping you'll stay, but the exposure is not negotiable. It's it's mandatory, and so you've got a decision to make, and that we call that the, the gentle ultimatum, and it, it's a loving and honest thing to do. It's an ethical thing to do because we're telling the patient this is in my universe, this is what works and this is what definitely doesn't work. And it's the same as you go to, to a doctor. I had this Dupuytren's contracture procedure on my hand mm-hmm. and, uh, 
and now I've got to do uh, hand exercises to make sure my my fingers don't go rigid, and and to, and to make sure I don't get what's called regional pain syndrome, and I have to open and close my fist. You know, I do it over two thousand times a day, and and I do other exercises as well, and it's and it's working. But That's great. if you if, right, yeah, and I'm thrilled. But but it's hard. It hurts. And uh, if when I wake up in the morning, I have to have my hand in kind of a cast type of thing at night. When I wake up in the morning, and it just my it hurts so much even to move my fingers. But I've got to do that if I want to get the great result. And every day my hands are feeling less in pain and more movable. And I can do things, I can open and close my fist now, which I couldn't do for so long. So if, if you want the result, you've got to pay the price. And, 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 if, and if you're getting sucked in by reverse hypnosis, that's because of your own codependency as a therapist. And if you don't want to set limits with your patients and, uh, and make some demands at times, then, you know, be, be my guest. But I, 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 I'm, I, I, I'm not trying to do that kind of therapy because I know what works and what doesn't work. And I don't want to be wasting the time of my own time and the time of patients who, who want to be treated by, by some idea that, to my way of thinking, it isn't going to be effective. And this is very, very controversial. Some therapists will probably hate me and some lay people for, for saying this, thinking, oh, you're supposed to help everyone and you should never kick people out of therapy. Well, I've never kicked anyone out of therapy. I'm just telling you, if you want to work with me, this is what you're going to have to do. And if you don't want to uh, you know, use the, the, the medication I'm recommending, I don't mean antidepressants, I mean exposure, I mean psychotherapy homework, then I'm not the doctor for, for you and you need to go to someone else. And I always tell people, if you, if you leave and it doesn't work out, you're always welcome to return. My door is always open to you. So, you know, this is episode 299, and you probably got this email s- sent to you a long time ago. And just two weeks ago in episode 297, we did an episode completely dedicated to homework where you gave lots of explanations of why we use homework. And including that, you know, you said it's unethical. Maybe it's not unethical. But, you know, if you absolutely know that homework works, to improve the lives of our patients, it is kind of unethical not to insist that they do homework. Like you, you kind of made the metaphor to, or you likened it to medication, you know, saying diabetes and insulin might be too extreme, but you know that if you have diabetes, you have to take insulin in order to stay healthy. Like you just described in order to have more full functioning of your hand and to reduce the pain, you have to do exercises. So, you know, we know that reducing you know, symptoms of depression and have helping people find a, a life of joy and enlightenment, they have to do homework. And it is kind of unethical not to insist on homework because that's not the path to the alleviation of their symptoms. And one thing I've found that you've, you have really helped me with, David, is your concept of self-help, the self-help, the concept of self-help memo that I send out to every um, new patient and there you lay out the purpose of treatment to feel better and how self-help includes homework and the necessity of homework. And I think you lay out like 22, 23 reasons why people wouldn't want to do homework. And people, you know, I have had my clients tell me very often that they feel really good after reading that concept of self-help that they completely understand what therapy is going to be like with me. It sets a really firm kind of foundation for what we're going to be doing. And it kind of takes the pressure off me to have to be the, you know, the bad guy, not that doing homework is bad, but I don't have to be like, you have to do homework and like play this heavy role because it's beautifully laid out in the concept of self-help, which you can find in the therapist toolkit that is on your that is sold on the feelinggood.com website. That's maybe very I, important. May, maybe I can be talked into putting that into a PDF and then attaching it to the show notes so people can take a look at the concept of self-help memo. Oh, that would be very generous of you. Yeah, I think I'll, I think I'll go ahead and do that because the general public might enjoy reading it and therapists alike. Yeah. yeah. 
Okay. Wow, that's really nice. Thank you. But I'm but I might say that this is a very controversial area because therapists like many therapists, most therapists want to be nice and they don't want to issue an ult, a gentle ultimatum to their patients and they think if I'm nice enough the patient will do homework. If I'm nice enough the patient will eventually do exposure. And I I had that philosophy my, myself for years and never once did it work. That's why I changed <laughs> and <laughs> developed team therapy and began to say to patients at the beginning of therapy, if if you'd like this problem solved and the prognosis is super positive, but here's one thing that you're going to have to do. And I hope you'll do it because it'll be a joy to help you change your life. But if you don't want to do it, I, I give you 200%, but then I'm not the therapist you're looking for. And therapists have trouble doing that. I, I understand. But as the Buddha said so many years ago, therapists who don't want to hold their patients accountable are screwed. <laughs> I was going to say are slackers. Yeah, that's, that's, he said that too. Yep. <laughs> All right. I guess that's, that's a topic that we both have strong opinions about. Yeah. Um, here is our next question, and it's about ADHD and procrastination. And well, that, is, that that that's you're thinking about. No, number eight. Oh, okay. Because um, number six is about ADHD and procrastination. No, this one is too. Oh, okay. She talks okay. About it. Cool. Um, so this is from Heather, not Heather Clegg, another Heather. And she writes, I have a question for you about the podcast you did on ADHD. I totally agree with you about ADHD not being a diagnosis and agree that it's more helpful to treat the symptoms. And by that, we're talking about attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. And she writes, many of the clients that I work with have been diagnosed with ADHD or are convinced that they have it. Procrastination procrastination seems to be a common symptom of ADHD that people want help with and that can be treated easily with the team model with the anti-procrastination and the motivational tools. The symptom that people ask help for that, I'm, that I feel less confident about helping them with is the difficulty they have with focus and distractibility. And I would love your thoughts about how to treat those symptoms. I have improved my own focus with motivational techniques and with practicing bringing my attention back to what I want to focus on when my mind starts to wonder. Also, taking notes has helped me to stay focused. But I am curious if you have other ideas about increasing focus. And just, just sometimes the people I work with have, also have distorted thoughts about focus as well, such as if I'm not interested in something, I can't focus on it. And I need medication to focus, et cetera. Also, do you treat hyperactivity and excessive talking? I've also noticed that parents sometimes play an enabling role with kids diagnosed with ADHD, and they don't require their children to do homework, schoolwork that they think is too hard or if they're bored and have a hard time focusing. I hope you're doing well, Dr. Burns. Warmly, Heather. Great. Um, before we answer this excellent and important question, uh, I think you mentioned that we've already done at least one and probably two podcasts on procrastination that we can refer people to. And then we'll focus on the ADHD part in, uh, in today's uh, Q&A. Okay. Yes. And that's podcast number 75 that you did with Fabrice. And that's on... Um, using the anti-procrastination sheet and other methods for working with procrastination. Uh, yes, as well as the I stubbornly refuse thing. Is that the one? Mission accomplished. Yes. Yeah, yeah that's, those are some cool techniques. Well, do you want to respond first to the ADHD thing? I've been jabbering self-centeredly when you ask a question. And let me give, give you a first shot at this. Um. Well, you know, some of the things that we had talked about uh, before the podcast started uh, was, some, was some of the things that Heather actually brought, brought up. 
is that sometimes it takes some, you know, this sounds, you know, I, you know, I'll make, this sounds harsh, but it does take some discipline when someone is going off topic to pull them back to the topic and say, no, we're only going to talk about this one thing right now. We're going to focus on this and this moment at this time. It's kind of a bit of mindfulness, like what's going on in this moment. And when, when, like, because I often have patients too that Heather described where, where we're starting something, like perhaps we're starting a technique like the downward arrow. And as we're going through it, then they bring up, well, wait, 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 I, I need to tell you about, you know, this situation that happened. I want to tell you about that too. And I'll, and I have to say, okay, we'll come back and let's finish this technique. And then we're going to start, then we can, when we're finished with this technique and we're done with this whole process, then you can bring up the second topic because we can only deal with one thing at a time. So it sort of takes some discipline from for us and some guidance and to pull people back to the, the focus and that, and it is take discipline for them to do that, to also pull back. And I'm kind of babbling are pulling them into the focus of the moment that we're talking about. The one thing that we're talking about at the time is kind of role modeling for what they can do when they're outside of our office. And, and like today I was working with someone who has this issue and she came up with together. We came up with the, technique that every day she's going to decide that there are three things she's going to do and then she's going to focus on what she needs to do for those three things and that's and that's all she's and if any time her mind wanders to a different task and she's going to come back to focusing on the three things that she decided to do when she first woke up woke up that morning I don't know if that's helpful yeah (laughs) sure um yeah. You know, also, the, you know, working with somebody who has the distorted thoughts, like, you know, it is, it is, I can't focus, I can't concentrate, you know, I can imagine that there are a lot of cognitive distortions within those thoughts and just going through the team model of challenging those thoughts could be also super helpful. Yes, uh, your great comments. Thank you, Rhonda. The, I don't treat ADHD. I don't treat depression. I don't treat anxiety. I don't treat schizophrenia. I don't treat anything in the DSM. I just treat human beings Mm. and I treat them as individuals and systematically. Um, And and so if I am working with someone with so-called ADHD and you can argue that that is a valid diagnosis and you can argue that it's not a valid diagnosis that is just a cluster of symptoms that some some people have but regardless uh, i i i i would first empathize with the person once i get an a from them in empathy i would see what is it they they want help with maybe we'd work out a daily mood log at, at a particular moment they were upset and then see what they want help with and then melt away their resistance and uh, and then after we've done the you know e equals empathy and a equals assessment of resistance, then take a thought from their daily mood log that they want help with, put it in a recovery circle, and come up with ten or fifteen or twenty ways of of smashing that thought, just the same as I would with 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 anyone else. So it's a highly individualized approach. Um, you know, I, I, I can say we probably most of us have symptoms of, of ADHD from from time to time. Uh, and, and, you know, we've probably all had to figure out how to deal with it to some extent. When I went to college, I went to Amherst College and I came from Phoenix, Arizona, where, you know, it, a lot of the other kids were from prep schools. They were really brilliant kids in that freshman class. And uh, the the, the lecturers often lectured at a very high level that I wasn't used to. And I remember when I would go to the the, the freshman lectures, they'd have, you know, two or three hundred, you know, our whole class, I guess, in a lecture from some famous person. And I never had the slightest idea of what they were talking about. I I, I couldn't concentrate. I, I couldn't figure it out at all. And so after the classes, when I would walk out, I would just grab someone else in the class. Say, could you explain to me what what he was trying to say just now? Uh, and and then the person would say, oh yeah, he was just trying to explain that blah blah blah. And then I would suddenly get it. I say, oh thank you. Now now I understand. Uh, but 
you know, that, that was just something, something that worked for me. And, and if you focus on a particular moment when, when you're having trouble, you, you can brainstorm all kinds of ways to, 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 to figure it out. When, when I, uh, when I came back to California from, uh, Pennsylvania, when we moved back to California, I had to take an exam in, in medicine exam, uh, again to, to get my California license back, an oral exam. Oh, and I had, yeah, and wow. I hadn't done medicine for over 20, 20 years since I was in California when I originally got, got licensed. Then I, sub, then I was able to apply and get licensure in Pennsylvania, but I let my California license go out. And I was doing uh, psychiatry the whole time psychotherapy and so i didn't remember any of my any of my medicine and it was going to be an oral exam and they could ask you anything about the eye i never even had an eye rotation i don't know anything about the eye so it was terrifying to me and i had to study like like crazy to prepare for for that thing and and it wasn't interesting to me i've never cared about diabetes or all these medical things i sh- i never should have gone to medical school in the first place it just wasn't my cup of tea so i made flashcards and i would go through i make uh, two, 100 flashcards on diabetes you know like basic questions about diabetes and then i would put the question on one side and the answer on the other and then i'd go through my flashcards over and over again and when i got it right i would discard the card and and go so i keep going through them until i got them all answered and they wouldn't even stay in my brain for more than a few hours but i kept doing that i got up at one two three in the morning and i would start studying like like crazy when we moved back here to to, to california and then when I took my oral exam, it, it, it paid off because, you know, they asked me things that I'd been preparing for and I was able to rattle off all kinds of great answers. And I think I passed with flying colors. But, you know, I've always, I, I don't find a lot of things interesting. A lot of things are boring. And I, I've always kind of just made up some way to entertain myself with, with what, whatever, whatever I had to do. But there aren't standard formulas. It's forming a relationship with, with, with your patient and then go, going through the, the step-by-step process, it just, <coughs> just as you do, do with anybody. And, uh, you know, I find that pays off. I don't know if that makes any sense to you, Rhonda. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And did you, is there a level of acceptance yeah, sure. I mean, I, I accept the, the fact that I, you know, I, I you know, I, I'm bored with things, and you know, I, my my mind jumps from thing thing to thing, and uh, yeah, I mean, you, you know, it's if you're not judging yourself, then you can just figure figure a way to 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 cope with with whatever whatever your situation is. But, but when you're upset, it, it ADHD isn't disturbing you. It's only your distorted thoughts about it that that can uh, uh, upset you. And we're we're in the business of helping people overcome guilt and shame and anxiety and frustration and anger and depression and and uh, loneliness and so forth and and and, and feel happy. And uh, uh, we all have a lot of a lot of defects and deficiencies and you do the best with what you've got but your mood your mood uh, depends on your thoughts not you know what you're born with and what your natural uh, uh, ability is we all have defects of all kinds of things you know i've I, I think i've said it on a podcast before but i when i look at things i often can't see things that are right in front of me and it's, it's always been a problem for me uh and it's just something i have to cope with if you know if i lose something i have to ask my wife where it is Mm-hmm. And if you can find stuff just like that, that I've been looking for for hours and I can't find, I, I don't know. I, did I give the example of when, what happened once when I was pooping? No. Oh, well, this, this, this is a good one. Is that one. the one I, about your cat on your shoulder? No, this is another pooping story. I, this <laughs> was my second pooping story. <laughs> so I hope, I hope you love my pooping stories, but uh, I, I was in the, in, in our, uh, the bathroom at the top of our stairs uh, ha- taking a poop and then i looked at the news at the roll you know and it was empty and i got panicky 
and I kind of got up and kind of squeezed my butt cheeks together so nothing would drip on the floor and looked in the, in the, <laughs> the, the like of a cabinet in there and there was none in there. Oh, and no. I went and sat back down. I shouted, Melanie, you know, I, oh, no. bring me some, some toilet paper. Oh, poor Melanie. Uh, there, there's, there, there's, there, I can't find any toilet paper in here. And she started laughing and, 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 and she said, are you joking? I says, no, I'm pooping <laughs> and, and I need some toilet paper. And, and, and she said, have you considered looking right in front of you? I said, what do you mean? She said, look on the floor right in front of you. And uh, you see, I was sitting on the, on, the, on the toilet and I looked in front of me <laughs> and there were like 72 rolls of toilet paper <laughs> in this huge transparent package. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> And I hadn't seen them. So, you know, we all have have our defects. I remember when I took an IQ uh, test in college uh, and uh, they would show me a picture of like a, a, a cow w- with, a, with a missing leg, <laughs> something like that. <laughs> and they'd say, well, is there something wrong with this picture? <laughs> and I would say, no, it looks perfect to me. <laughs> And then, they'd, and then they'd say, can't you see that this cow has a missing leg? i say, oh, yeah, the leg is missing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I mean, you know, sure, we, we have, uh, I don't mean to make fun of anybody. We all have, have liabilities, but it's, uh, you don't solve these things with, with formulas. You, you solve them with compassion and, and a systematic approach. And that's what team, team therapy is, is all about, is treating people as human beings, not as diagnoses. And you come in with some formula uh, to, uh, to, to, to solve the, the equation, so to speak. You, you work with people systematically. And the solution for every person is, 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 is different. And that's, that's, that's why it's such a joy. And uh, that, that, that's why we... we we love our patients. We lo- we love our work, and we we love people seeing people change their lives and escape from suffering and feelings of inadequacy and discover feelings of joy. That that's a miracle, and that's the miracle we're that's 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 the business that we're in is trying to share this miracle with with people and with you, our listeners, mm-hmm. our listeners. Well, I think we have time for one more because this will be. A oh, short we do! One. Wow, yeah. cool. And this is um, hello, Dr. Burns. Is it okay if I do the written work when I do my homework or my personal work by typing in my laptop on a word processor, or must I write it on a piece of paper? Thank you. Well, that's a seemingly uh, silly question. No, no. Mark Noble, our our neuroscientist, has a very strong opinion about that. Well, that that was what I was about to say. Oh, okay. It sounds silly, but it's not, and I don't know the answer to it. Well, when if we get Mark on a future podcast, we can ask him that, or ask him to 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 give us his uh, his opinion to add to add to the show notes, perhaps. But 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 I don't know. And and I I started out uh, writing everything on pieces of paper. And when I'm in sessions, I write down what the patient is saying so I can summarize it and, and give good empathy and say, here's what I think you just said, and here's how I think you might be feeling. And if I do that, I get an A on, on, on empathy. And, and it's the same thing on the homework. It might be that writing your negative thoughts longhand and, and then responding to them in longhand is a more effective way of reprogramming your brain, it, that might work better than doing it on Microsoft Word and with some of the forms I've created for Microsoft Word and typing in the negative thoughts and the positive thoughts. Um, and we, we, what, what's your opinion here, uh, Rhonda? Well, I really like writing them out by hand. Um, you know, when you fill out, the, I filling, filling out the daily mood log or the daily mood journal, it's really simple to fill that out online. And, you know, the relationship journal, there are a lot of forms you have that are, that are easy to do online. Um, but there's something about, like, when you're writing out the positive reframe, for example, when you're looking at the advantages that a negative, that a negative thought or challenging feeling says for you, like, r- where you write, 
you know, the feeling sadness, unhappy. And what does that feeling say about you? That's really awesome or gives you an advantage or speaks to your core values. I always really like to write those out. Um, it feels like I have it. I remember it better. It feels like it sinks in more. Yeah. But, I know what you mean. Yeah. A cost benefit analysis that just feels stronger when I'm writing it out. And then, I, um, I do too. I'm old fashioned. I've developed all these fabulous forms for my patients, but when I'm treating them, I do everything on paper by hand. Yeah. And I feel that way too. Maybe we're just old fashioned and and elderly. No, Uh, I think that Mark Noble, our neuroscientist says that there's, there's an, there's a, like you said, we're going to have him on pretty soon. We can ask him again to tell us, but there's a, there's a connection between writing it out, hand writing it and having it stick in your brain. Mm. We'll ask him, maybe certain neural uh, networks are better activated when you're writing things out by hand. It's probably somewhat speculative, but we'll, we'll, we'll get his, his input for all of you and let, let you know what he, what he says. But that was a really neat, neat, neat question. Whew. Okay. Well, all the other questions are going to take a while for us to answer or for you to answer. So shall we say bye for now and do another Ask David later? Yes, and we'll try to get Matt back as as soon as possible. We might try some other people on an Ask David too. I know Kai, Dr. Kai Chen is a young psychiatrist in our Tuesday group, who's really cool, and we'd like to bring him onto a, a podcast and an, answer some questions and stuff too. Um, but uh, we we love our our Matt May, and we're just sorry he couldn't join us. But we've saved a lot of the harder questions for him. So <laughs> look forward to the next uh, Ask David, and we'll we'll get Matt back. And but keep sending us the questions and comments. We 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 really appreciate and love all of you therapists and lay people, and deeply appreciate this chance to connect with you every month. Last month uh, we had uh, I think our biggest uh, ever. Uh, uh, over 165,000 downloads. Was that it? Uh, oh, Robert? yeah. Mm-hmm. And um, so keep telling your friends about us. We don't have any commercials. We don't make any money from this. You're our marketing team. So if you know somebody who's depressed or if you know a therapist who might be looking to learn some new new techniques, uh, th- those that's our audience. And Or if you have a mailing list, maybe a, a church group or a synagogue group or something, you can maybe mention, oh, there's these free feeling good podcasts and they really help people with depression and anxiety and relationship problems. So uh, we're, we're just honored to serve all of you and grateful that so many of you were tuning in. Well, thank you. Well said. I can't, I don't have anything else to add to that. So just thank you until next time. Okay. Bye bye, Rhonda. Bye, David. This has been another episode of the Feeling Good podcast. For more information, visit Dr. Burns' website at feelinggood.com, where you will find the show notes under the podcast page. You will also find archives of previous episodes and many resources for therapists and non therapists. We welcome your comments and questions. If you want to support the show, please share the podcast with people who might benefit from it. You could also go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating. I am your host, Rhonda Borowski, the director of the Feeling Great Therapy Center. We hope you enjoyed this episode. I invite you to join us next time for another episode of the Feeling Good Podcast.